Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for making it to the 4 p.m. session. <laughs> uh, really excited that y'all are here with us um, and with our extremely distinguished guest. Um, I'm Denise Rojas. I'm a PGY1 at Boston Medical Center, um, and I'll be one of the uh, co-moderators of the session. Hi, everyone. My name is Bernice Spokum, and I'm a PGY2 at University of Chicago Emergency Medicine, and I'm also going to be one of the co-moderators. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today's talk is on the role of the emergency medicine uh, physician on firearm safety and... And we'll, surgeon. And surgeon. <laughs> any, any surgeons in the room. Um, and uh, really excited to talk to you about um, a lot of the practical work that um, our uh, uh, session panelists have come and come from different parts of the country to give us uh, an idea of um, you know, what we can do as emergency medicine physicians. So to go into introductions, we have Dr. Lauren Hudak. Um, she's an emergency... <laughs> She's an emergency medicine physician at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, also an assistant professor at Emory University and assistant director of the Injury Prevention Research Center at Emory. Um, and Dr. Peter Masiakos. <laughs> he is a pediatric general and thoracic surgeon at Harvard Medical, at, at Mass General and then associate professor at Harvard Medical School. And in 2019, he co-founded the MGH Center for Gun Violence Prevention, uh, dedicated to a multidisciplinary approach to mitigating uh, gun violence. And then last but not least is Dr. Abdullah Hassan Pratt, uh, who is an assistant professor at Emory Medi um, at prof assistant professor and emergency medicine physician at University of Chicago. <laughs> 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 and um, he's, he has an extremely robust number of initiatives um, that he, he'll talk about during um, the panel session, um, but all aim to vigorously improve the health, literacy, and emergency preparedness among residents in uh, Southside Chicago. Okay, so before we have um, and hear from our panelists, we wanted to start off with giving um, some data and um, as well as uh, framing around the panel session that we will um, get more into detail about. So first of all, it is needless to say that firearm um, violence is one of the most complex and pressing public health issues of our time today. And uh, one important number is that uh, about 100,000 people each year or 270 uh, per day are shot um, by firearm in our country and ultimately nearly 40,000 people die. Um, we also have uh, very recent data from the CDC that um, has uh, more, more, yeah, more new data. Um, so one of them that was um, an estimate from 2020 is that the firearm homicide rate has reached its highest level since 1994. Um, so the, the estimate is that firearm homicide rate is 6.1 per 100,000 individuals, or uh, roughly a 35% increase from uh, data the, the previous year, which was in 2019. And as um, no surprise to all of us here, um, is that the, those rates are highest among black, American Indian, and Alaskan Native individuals. Um, and when you look at the suicide rates um, of firearm, that is even higher than the homicide rate, which is an estimated 8.1 per 100,000 persons. And um, the folks that are highest impacted by uh, suicide, um, suicide rates by firearm are folks who are older, white, American Indian, and Alaska Native individuals. Um, I'll put a big asterisk on all of this information because it is extremely difficult to quantify um, the impact of, of violence um, by firearm or um, the impact that this has made in our communities. Um, it's, it's really difficult to quantify because it's not, the people that are impacted aren't just those who are shot. 
or those who witnessed the shooting, or um, you know the families who are part of uh, the violence. Um, you know, it, it, there are ripple effects within our communities, and and I think this is um, part of the framework of our conversation today: is how do we um, reimagine our uh, discussion on this topic as a, as a public health issue. Um, so Bernice will um, have a discussion. So I think, you know, as Denise was mentioning, gun violence, as we all know, as we work in the emergency room, we are very much so on the front lines and we see the impacts. We hear the screams of mothers. We see the tears. We see people who have PTSD because of the um, effects that they see in their communities. These are very real, tangible. This is not theoretical. This is very real. This is very salient. And this is very present. This is urgent as well. Unfortunately, though, even though we know these things, a lot of us don't know how to talk about them. And part of that is intentional because these things are not taught to us. As learners, as trainees, it is very, very ostensibly absent from a lot of our curriculum. It's very absent from, um, uh, from productive dialogue because this is an issue that we all know has become very charged, very political, um, and very personal to a lot of people. But it doesn't mean that we can't talk about it and doesn't mean that we don't come up with ways to address it and mitigate it in the spaces that we can within the realm of um, that we can. And so um, a lot of the talk today and a lot of the discussion that we're going to have is how do we incorporate these discussions into educational spaces? And then more importantly, what comes next? So yes, we already know that this is an urgent issue and we know that we need to engage in these and, and education around it. But then what do we do? What do we bring to our communities? How do we make sure that it makes impact? How do we measure that this impact is going the direction that we need it to go? And how do we sustain it? So these are kind of the things that are the most pressing and the most urgent. And so I am very, very excited for us to go into the section where each of our panelists is going to talk about it from different angles. We have people who are really focused on education, curriculum development. We have people who are in the streets working with communities, doing community-led education, um, and seeing what kind of ideas that we can get from experts in the field. And then subsequently, we really want to hear about what's happening in the room. I know that some of the people who are in the room are experts in their own rights and are doing work that is extremely impactful. And so our goal is for this to be idea sharing and for it to cultivate a discussion that does not stop here but is launched here. Okay? So from that, we are going to start with Dr. Lauren Hudak. If you could tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing, the impacts that you think um, has been made, and where, where you see it going. Hey guys, I'm so thrilled to be here today um, amongst these wonderful humans. And just even before this, we all have a different skill set that's just so interesting to explore. And even with you in the room, it's really great to kind of hear where your passion, where your interest, um, and then also what skill set you think you need and sort of advice you might think about starting if you have an idea about what it is you're, you're interested in. So um, yeah, I started as many of you guys, I think Newtown was my like kick to start thinking about um, firearm violence prevention. It's like, if you can go into preschool and shoot up the place and still, you know, and still somehow guns are okay, like that was my idea and really my motivation, I think as a clinician and a physician to get to move into this space. So I have a background in public health and uh, I teach a violence prevention class in the fall, every year in the fall. Um, and we have kind of a novel curriculum in that we do um, hands-on based education for learners to help people feel culturally competent in firearm safety discussions. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you were here a couple years back in Las Vegas at SEM, we did a similar session where we took folks out, folks out to the range, um, taught them how to like handle firearms, different types of ammunition type, and all of that so that you can feel more comfortable in those one-on-one -on -one conversations with patients. Because um, at my heart, I'm a clinician, I take care of patients, and I want to be able to help people realize their real risk of firearm injury. Um, suicide prevention is m mainly my focus and energy, and I really do care about helping folks who have substance use disorder, um, cognitive um, impairment, uh, mental health issues, really understand that that you know, loaded firearm in their bedside table is actually much more likely to be used for self-inflicted injury rather than for you know, that non-existent intruder that maybe never robbed you. you know, so really helping people realize their risk and, um, and have a tangible one-on-one -on -one discussion with that patient to help them sort of uh, do that. 
And so in that, I've explored with lots of, even many people in the room, just how to do that in a culturally competent way. Because as a person with not a lot of firearm experience, I felt wholly unequipped to have these discussions with our, and I'm from Georgia, so it's very you know, gun-owning, proud gun-owning populations. And so how do you have a non-condescending discussion with somebody if you really just, you don't really know much about guns, like how they work, how to, how, how to operate them. So um, we did residence training sessions. Um, I also do that with our public health class as well. And um, some of that, a lot of resistance actually. So I had a lot of resistance initially within my, de my own department, within, um, and still, still do sometimes, with folks that don't really understand why hands-on training is necessary. Um, yeah, but that's, that's one passion I've had, is really being able to kind of move that. Um, research is another area. I've really, um, in my heart, I'm a clinician, I'm an educator, but I really do care about research. How do we measure? Some of the things that, that Bernice had mentioned about measuring firearm injuries, is it's very hard to know. We have great, pretty good death data, so out there with a the National Violent Death Reporting System and other sort of metrics, but um, how to measure the impact of firearm um, and, and morbidity, that, that's a really elusive concept. So some of my projects are related to that. Um, and then another thing too is um, how people store firearms. So usually, you know, everyone, the mantra is locked, um, get, um, ammunition stored separately and locked. So that's what we try to tell our patients, but that looks very different. You know, some people have it in like a shoe box in their closet. Like how do I, you know, and how can we measure and communicate to each other what's the safest form? And survey data doesn't always accurately capture that, you know, and so how, so um, yeah, so there's a lot of different areas I'm interested in and, and, and explore. Um, but what I'd be interested in is sort of seeing, is are, are folks in the room, anybody researchers in the room? Or most educators? What about interested in education? I'd love to sort of hear, yeah, what you guys are interested in, because then we can, um, who, d um, are anyone want to do curriculum development? Maybe, or just exploring, we'll see. So at the end of, so at the end of this, we'll have a, like a feedback QR code just to sort of connect with you to figure out what it is you're hoping to get out of this session and what we can, we can hopefully connect and collaborate to try to further the, the realm. Because it's gonna be you know, a lot of ad political advocacy, um, hospital-based violence intervention. There's so many opportunities and for everyone of different skill sets. You may not be that person who's gonna get up there with like the sign on you know, Capitol Hill and try to get into policy, or you may be a data person, you know, but there's a lot of op opportunity for whatever your skill set is to get involved in this space. So hopefully we can cultivate that passion you have and what got your, you know, your butt in the, in the seat today, like what that skill set, what you bring to the table and how we can cultivate that to make moves. So. Let me add something to that, actually. I think the important thing here to leave with is that nobody has an answer yet. So nothing has really changed with, the, with respect to how we communicate with our patients. We try our best to figure it out, but we haven't come to that place. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it when I, when I get there, but I don't want people to feel like you gotta give us the right answer here. This is a dialogue. I, I'm, I'm a pediatric surgeon. I've come from it in a different way. I'll talk about that. But if you have an idea, this is the place we need to hear about because somebody else may have that same idea and then you meet and you have something that you've started together. Uh, it's incredibly important, I'll touch on it a bit. I didn't want to steal okay. it, but I'm a pediatric surgeon and I steal things from you. You can steal it. Oh, totally fine. I'm, I'm absolutely used to it, <laughs> so totally fine. My, my partner is a surgeon too, so we're, anyway. Um, yeah, so, so with that, I think, um, you know, the next steps for, I think, and, and that I see is critical for the field is really hashing out some of that, those measurement issues, like how can we have firearm injury surveillance a little bit more improved? I, there's a lot of different um, funding streams are much more prolific than they used to. So there's, you know, CDC puts out um, grants now really specifically for firearm injury prevention. So the money's coming, and so I think us, you know, collaborating to help think through data-driven strategies are the most important way to kind of really harness this. Um, I think really understanding as a field, like where, where um, 
where the injuries are. And, and suicide prevention, I think, is an un, we always, we do know about homicide rates going up. That new MMWR report is very eye-opening. But suicide is a huge burden of firearm death. And so really being able to help our, our patients. And you guys, when you're talking to patients, like think about it. Think about screening. Think about intervening. And how, how you can feel more comfortable having those discussions with patients. So there is a whole bunch of resources out there to help, you know, to help folks kind of get more comfortable with that, those conversations. So if anyone's interested in those, we can circulate, um, circulate those materials. And some of the work you do, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and I think depoliticizing it, especially in the exam room. Like when you're with a patient, it's not about you and your thoughts. It's about helping them make safer choices for them. And so really, you know, trying to keep pol politics and, you know, Second Amendment stuff out of the exam room, I think, is really important for us, even though it's hard. Like, we do see the impact of, of gun violence, and really, you know, a lot of us in our heart, you know, really dislike guns. You know, but I think some people don't feel that way, and so it's how you make it more about what's comfortable for that patient. So, yeah. So with that, I guess I'll turn over to... Yeah. Thank you so much, I'm Dr. Hudak. And so now we're going to have Dr. Pratt tell us very similarly, you are very, very engaged with the community. You have had, you know, unfortunately, a lot of even personal relationships with the effects of gun violence. And so it's really motivated you to do a lot of work, both in the research space and in the community space. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? I know you have some visual aids. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I like to focus on a lot of the youth that we work with. Uh, in the streets, so I'll leave everything about myself to this one slide, read through it. I'm sure everybody has extremely good literacy in this room, uh, but we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> but I'm Abdullah, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Uh, as Bernie said, I've lost a lot of people to violence. I just lost one of the youth from one of my programs a couple of days ago, and we had a, a, a press conference in front of our hospital about it. So that's how close I am to violence. It's always something, I'm getting text messages as we speak. Um, about the violence that's happening in our city right now that's gotten really bad. Uh, one of the programs that I've founded when I was a resident at U Chicago, uh, with the help of a lot of our program directors, but really the residents and house staff, was our Medical Careers Exposure and Emergency Preparedness Program. It was a program that has violence prevention at its core, but it's through solving some of the other problems that peripherally surround violence, one being the lack of response by lay bystanders in the communities, which really is more of a measure of the helplessness that a lot of the community members feel, where even if someone's shot in front of you, uh, we're finding out from our data that there's extreme delays that are almost unbelievable between the time someone is shot and between the time that someone calls EMS. So we teach our youth how to deal with gunshot wounds via stop the bleed. We teach hands-only CPR, stroke recognition, and head injury recognition so that those youth can do that. In that process, we also try to expose them into the medical career so that they can be leaders like ourselves to change their own neighborhoods. And we've worked with almost uh, 2,500 students in the last four years since starting that program, many of them more recently. Uh, we'll go to our next uh, slide. So this is just what that looks like. Um, we utilize youth uh, who are house staff or faculty who oftentimes come from the same communities our students are from. And these are the just to paint a picture for you all, these are the communities you all see in rap videos. These are the communities you all see uh, across the national headlines for violence on the south side of Chicago. Uh, our hospital is literally surrounded by some of the hottest areas in the country, the rap beefs, all those. We take care of these rappers. We don't know that. We just see young teenagers in front of us. But oftentimes, we come to find out these are high-profile people uh, that we're in front of. But those are also game changers as well because they have a voice. So that's one of the things we try to do. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, out of that program, what we found is that the students couldn't even get through the emergency preparedness talks and trainings without first asking my residents and students, well, how do you cope if you see this every day? Which was really a proxy way of leading into how am I supposed to cope? Uh, if, if I see an emergency. And what this sounds like is the students would say, oh, you know, thank you for teaching us this, but my cousin, he was shot out in front of the house and this happened. And then the next person says, well, I was at a car accident and somebody's arm was cut off and nobody did anything and I didn't know what to do. The next person says, well, you know, we were at basketball practice and somebody collapsed and uh, we didn't know, know what to do. Somebody may have started chest compression, somebody didn't. And we would 
struggle to even finish the workshops because it was just so much which would then lead to, I don't walk down the street because that was where my cousin was shot and it's in front of my school, so I have to take the long way to school. Or I don't, I'm late to school, I missed the whole year of school, uh, was held back because uh, one of my friends was sexually assaulted on the pathway to school, so now we all wait for each other to come pick each other up and you know, you string that along, everybody's in the mirror doing their hair. Now a young lady is truant too much and her parent doesn't show up for the parent-teacher conference and she's held back. Um, so we decided, we went to some of our behavioral health experts at the University of Chicago, and we figured, well, you know what, since these programs aren't funded, and none of my programs are funded, by the way, um, because they're not funded, maybe we can leverage the resources of our trauma center to actually bring that into the community instead of just being a hospital-based uh, program. So that's where the Trauma Recovery and Prevention of Violence program came from, where we use our trauma behavioral health experts, we use our violence recovery team that do these things in the trauma bay from the moment someone's shot or a victim of any violence, and they start trying that recovery process. And I take them, utilizing the position I have with so many of the local high schools, to actually seed them into workshops where I'm just in my residence, are really just bystanders and curators showing, sharing our experience, while these experts actually lead the students in not only training them on how to recognize uh, at risk and violent behaviors in themselves, as well as the situations that will lead to conflict so that they can conflict resolve, also recognizing suicidality, risky behavior, and peers, but the biggest goal is to expose them to a myriad of different health, behavioral health and trauma prevention career paths that they could say, I am the change in my own community. If Dr. Pratt is doing it, I, I can be better than him. And so we try to promote that. If Dr. Bernice is here or any of our residents are here, they know that all to be too well, but we can keep going. So this is kind of what the workshops look like. Um, next slide. Other programs that we also partner with, we go into the communities, we utilize the community gardens, which are usually um, spaces of violence, despair, that have been repurposed. Uh, and we use those as natural classrooms to teach these same workshops on you know, uh, violence awareness, trauma-informed care, but really letting them lead the way in terms of what they need in their own impact. And so those are just some of the images with our local youth. You can keep going. Bernice, we also go where people are most comfortable. So many of our youth, we know that youth sports programs were the way for many generations in black, Latinx, and indigenous communities to keep kids safe and out of violence. So we come straight to those programs with the same curriculum, the same trainings to empower them as vessels where the students are comfortable Instead of doing it in a trauma bay and waiting for that, why don't we go out there where they are and actually um, support these youth initiatives? And many of them have been partnered with our president, et cetera. And you can keep going. Um, we also partner with a program. We just got a big um, $1.5 million um, donation from the governor. So myself and Dr. Mir Hamid down there, who is our associate EMS director at UChicago, are the medical directors for the Black Fire Brigade, which, which privately funds through our EMTs on Chicago Southside a program that takes kids from the projects elsewise and teaches them financial literacy, pays their whole way through school, and 100% of these students get jobs. And they, they're at five, about a 500 in just about four years, uh, which is almost, I think, two or three million dollars worth just from those funds. And this is their first donation that they got from the governor, no strings attached. Uh, next slide. So we also partner with a lot of other organizations. That's the big thing to take away. I am a by I'm the youngest member of these teams most of the time. Most of these organizations see me as a little brother, so they support. Uh, and I'm and my program is leased to their different programs. So uh, you go to the next one. So that's Senator Robin Kelly. Uh, so like Project Outreach and Prevention is an example of that. This is run by ASEP's uh, Firearms Committee Chair Mike McGee uh, in his program, which goes in Northwest Indiana, Chicago. Brings a lot of funding. Pep rally. That's 92.3, our big radio station. All of the rappers come out to the high schools and we use violence prevention through those networks to talk to the students. Uh, next slide. Another partner and someone who I look at as a peer and a big brother is Dr. Rob Gore, who's right there in New York uh, with Kings Against Violence Initiative, or Kabi, who's a very similar program, uh, who does this work and he, I consult him all the time about what we're doing. Uh, you can go to the next one. Um, and so that's pretty much it. Uh, another person in this room who I would probably see as one of those same kind of peers is Italo Brown. Uh, but I wrote a lot of my programs without very much research involved. Uh, that's not my trade. Uh, so you, anyone can do this type of work. My resources are the streets and the community, but I wrote those with people like Italo and others who do do public health around this in mind to be partners in the future. So I'll pass that on. Incredible, as always, Dee. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, and then our final, absolutely not least, panelist is um, Dr. Peter Masiakos, who founded the Center for Gun Violence Prevention at um, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. If you could tell us you know, what led you to that type of work. I know that you're a pediatric surgeon um, and you see the effects um, and where do you see us going? What are the next so steps? My, ho my hope uh, is to communicate that this is possible as an academic career also. Um, so I started my life as a pediatric surgeon at Boston City Hospital in 1991. And it was the thick of violence and gun uh, play in Boston. We had 18 gunshot wounds a night in August. It was pretty pretty prolific, and I was trained in trauma because I was there, right? And then I decided to go into pediatric surgery and married a Canadian and went to Toronto and trained there and came back without seeing one gunshot wound in two years. <laughs> All right. And then I was at Mass General as a, as a junior faculty doing tissue engineering work for my academic mission, and a eight-year-old boy who was put on an ATV and crashed it in the community and died was the first trauma patient I took care of. A year after that, his parents came to me and asked me if I would let, help them advocate for a new law in Massachusetts about ATV safety. And that started my career in, 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 in um, injury prevention. I didn't even think about guns until probably 2012, 2013, when everybody started thinking about guns because of Sandy Hook. However, I was in the middle of it for that much. And I started talking to the administration at about 2012 to see about funding a gun violence prevention center as part of the mission at Mass General, and it was denied and denied and denied and denied. And I went to my chair and I said, look, this is what I want to do. I'm advocating at the State House almost once a week about injury prevention laws. This is something that we need to address. And finally, in 2019, they lamented and gave me $1.3 million to start the center. It's kind of like Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption. If you bother them enough, they finally give you more than you asked for. <laughs> so, so I did. I bothered them until they gave me what I, I needed to do the center. Now, what is the center? It happened to start right as COVID started, so really not a great opportunity to expand it. But what we decided to build is a, is a center of three missions, a basic science mission, a education mission, where we're educating our residents about the fundamentals of how to speak to your patients about gun violence and gun access. And that was based on the merits that we looked at. We polled uh, only the emergency department and pediatric side looking for kids who were presenting with suicidal or homicidal ideation, and how many times that was documented in the medical record? 5%. So that was wrong, right? So we needed to figure out how to change that. We started a program where we built a simulation program where every single resident from every single department coming in to MGH now spends one hour of sim training talking to patient actors about access to lethal means. And the way we did it is we bought pizza and we got a, a, a stakeholder from every department. We sat in a room and we built curricula. One was accepting, one was objectionable, but everybody got an idea to test it. We did pre and post surveys, we just published it, it was awesome. But did that change? In one year we got that documentation up to 34%. It's okay, but we can do better. The problem is nobody knows how to ask the question right. And I think that our, our panelists here have talked about that issue, right? Dr. Hudak's talking about getting people to gun ranges to understand the weapon, because when you ask somebody who owns a gun, do you store it safely? The answer is gonna be yes all the time. Whether it's at your bedside table or under your bed or under the pillow, it's safe storage to them, right? <laughs> and, and Dr. Pratt getting to the community goes to my next message. Hannah Sachs, who's the co-director of our center, and I went to a community event about a month into our center. And on the stage was uh, who you would expect, the governor of Massachusetts, the attorney general, uh, um, the people who espouse gun violence prevention, pretty much all white men, right? And they were talking about how great Boston is. And part of it has to do with the legislation that was passed and the voters that are in your community that you attach, attach, attach to right away, right? 
At the back of the room was a woman who was involved in community engagement and activism who stood up and said, well, hey, you know, that's not my Boston. And one after another, she put young black men on the mic and basically said, I dodge bullets for a living. And that's where we went another step. We decided we need to hear from the community whose voices are most impactful, who experience this every day. And we partnered with an, uh, a college, Emerson College in Boston, to develop a curriculum program to teach the media kids who are gonna be the journalists, who are gonna be the reporters, what the actual narrative of gun violence is. And we had three members of the community as classmates. And it took a semester before they trusted the students enough to do what they did. And they produced the first video this year. They did a theater group, another, another group of theater students, and a curriculum developed in journalism. This is the video that was a sort of a little snippet of what was done, but I'd like to play it for you now. Okay, we'll set up online. Yeah. But the students and the survivors in the community got together and did a class project whereby they explained what the community was experiencing with respect to gun violence. And now we're taking it back to our curriculum and making the questions more appropriate for the people that are most apt to answer them. And so that's the, the goal of my work in the next few years. I hope that. Uh, I know it's going to be it's going to be a, a success in, in so far as the students who are graduating from Emerson now are equipped with the tools that they need to go and write about the stories that need to be written, not about if it bleeds, it leads. Right. So between the curriculum development and the Emerson project, um, I'm invested, and I no longer do basic science research, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been promoted, and I am able to get funding and grants. So. Um, please, uh, any questions that we might have in the audience, we, I guess we'll take now, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, we're right on time. So uh, we'll still keep trying to um, play this video, but in the meantime, we're going to um, get started. So I wanted to jump in and start with the first question. Um, so I know, um, Dr. Masiak, as you were saying, that you had tried and tried to get funding. It was denied. Um, you know, same uh, for Dr. Pratt. You know, it seems like these conversations are really hard to, um, or at least engage stakeholders. How, how do you do that? How do you normalize conversations around, um, you know, gun violence and prevention in your department and within your colleagues? So, I don't think that in, in our conversation, we, we, we exist on the south side of Chicago, so gun violence is about as normalized there as anywhere. You know, for God's sakes, they used to call that place Chirac, right? Um, I think the issue is that from top to bottom, from politicians to stakeholders across the board, it doesn't matter enough, right? You know, they don't walk the shoes that our staff, our nurses walk, our residents, our medical students, uh, where sometimes they have to be pulled aside just to debrief. Um, and they don't see that. They don't see our charge nurses who daughters and stepdaughters come in shot in the head uh, and now they, we try to get them jobs at the hospital. They don't see the nights that I'm having to be relieved off of shift because close family members get killed uh, while I'm walking into a trauma shift, right? The peop that is the depths that it seems like we have to go both in the community and with stakeholders before people say enough is enough, but that's too late. And unfortunately, we don't approach gun violence the same way we approach asthma, cancer, every other public health crisis, which is from a preventative aspect. Uh, it seems like from the media to politicians, that's not sexy enough. We have to have a crying mother on TV saying, put the guns down uh, before people want to turn to it and look, or we need a big rapper who's killed um, before we say enough is enough. But then after that, it's like whistles and back to normal um, with everything that we do. So I think we have to get to a point where we collaborate, right? I, I had to give it up a long time ago. My program directors will tell you that, you know, maybe you can't be great at everything, right? You can't be the best researcher and the best project designer, the best, you know, person with efficiency and the best, all of these things. So if you could just be a, a great clinician and do one other thing in academia, then maybe you just need to be partnered with someone else. 
And I think that's where the future has to come, which is that some people are best on the street. Some people are best, you know, uh, in academia, publishing, writing. Sometimes you just need a grant writer, right? Like, you know, some people say, hey, what can I do? And they try to come out and lead workshops with me. And that's not their skill set. And the community sees right through that. And they're like, you know, D, why you bring this person? And the truth <laughs> is, <laughs> that person... <laughs> You know, you find out that that person may have written like a hundred, you know, five, six hundred thousand dollars worth of grants for some random non for profit that sells flowers or something on Amazon. And you're like, yo, if you had just given that same hour or two towards like writing a grant for us, you would have changed the game. So I think that's where we all have to find our specific place, whether it's in the trauma bay, whether it's writing the grants, whether it's writing things up, or whether it's actually being out there in the community and people take pride in that to actually lead towards solutions. Okay. Cool. So uh, one of the things that I did really early on is I did exactly what Dee did, but I was theoretically the white savior going into the community, right? So I had to gain trust. And I say that with tongue in cheek, but the reality is we do this all the time, right? We, we, we are built making relationships. That's what we do. We meet somebody in the emergency department for the first time, and we get them to agree for us to basically assault them, right? And that's the thing we all have in us that's capable. That's goes again, that goes ag across the grains of policy making, advocacy, and this. And you got to talk the talk and walk the walk, right? I walked on, on Mother's Day with the mother of a kid that I took care of 23 years ago, right? A Mother's Day walk for peace. And we started by raising some money. We raised $5,000 the first year, and we raised $38,000 this year for that organization. And once you start getting into the community and gaining the trust of the people that you are likely to affect the most, they affect you a lot. It makes me a better doctor when my kids spent a month in the intensive care unit when they were born, right? It makes me a better communicator when I know the conversation I have to have with the mothers that we tell their kids are dying and never see them again after that and we know they don't have resources, and we don't, they don't have a burial plan that they leave the hospital with. So I think that's the stuff that makes it different, and no matter how many times we point at the problem, and there's lots of people pointing at the problem, we know there's a gun violence problem, and people are pointing at it, and researching it, and writing about it, and telling us it's getting worse, but until you go out and, and talk to the people, and face the people who see it every day, and hear the gunshots at night, and hear the sirens at night, and it disrupts their sleep, and it makes them not go to school the next day because they can't stay awake, and they don't have a bed to sleep in, and they're obese, and they have other issues that are all completely overlaid. That's when we solve the problem. And the guns, the 400 million guns, are not gonna go away tomorrow, but at least we can start having people think about it like I did when I was a medical student when we started talking about HIV. It's the same conversation. Um, so Dr. Hudak, I wanted to ask you, just like, why should patients listen to us? Like, why are, like, is this appropriate for us as physicians? Because this is actually, yeah. a, you know, a big question. And I know a lot of your research is yeah. around why, whether pa patients feel safe having these types of conversations, yeah. even though we know, you know, it's really relevant. I forgot to mention the way that Denise and I know each other is that we did our um, policy analysis exercise when we were getting our master's in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and we worked with the Massachusetts General for um, Gun Violence Prevention, and our project was all about why are we never taught on how to have these conversations, why are people so fearful, do we need to have these conversations, or should we let somebody who is you know, suicidal go home to an unloaded Absolutely. gun? Absolutely, like I mean, how? I think that is the, that's the question, I think, as all of us, since we're all physicians, like, at the end of the day, our skill set includes that. Absolutely, all of us should have that skill set to be able to have a safety discussion with a patient. And, um, and it really is for all the same reasons we're, we were talking about, preventing that person from having sequelae of that, of that problem. So unchecked mental health issues, suicidality, um, you know, how do you intervene with folks you know, in, in those settings. And so I think, and in, in ways that are comfortable for them. Like you don't, it, it's uncomfortable for us. So I think sometimes when you're not comfortable, they obviously, your patient 
can sense that and they know that you're not, you haven't had a lot of these discussions, you're not equipped to really, you know, give them a playbook of options of like, oh hey, like th this may not work for you, let's talk through what might. You know, and how do you get that next step for them to at least start thinking about it for the elements of change, just like we do with other behavioral health interventions. So I think injury prevention in general is so much analogous to a lot of the other successful fields like HIV AIDS, like, you know, sexual health. Like, if we can talk to people about what they have, you know, like, that's a really controversial topic, and we have those conversations all the time. So I don't see why talking to them about their gun and, like, where it's stored, what sort of risk factors they have, how to mitigate some of their high-risk behaviors, you know, we do that too. So you just make sure you're talking about those. Also, how do you get the gun out of the house while they're having a crisis, you know? So I think that's a really good, and it's in the interest of their safety. It's not like I'm trying to track your guns or I'm trying to get a registry and take your gun away. It's more, you know, hey, I care about you. I'm your doctor. I want to help you get better, and let's think about how to keep you safe. So in, those, in our research, we've demonstrated multiple providers can ask that, and it's acceptable. There's you know, um, they're really comfortable even, you know, in a complex variety of situations, including intimate partner violence, uh, um, cognitive impairment in elderly. Um, pediatric safety is obviously like one of the hallmark every time people are comfortable about talking about their kids' safety. So I think as providers, really challenging yourself to feel comfortable having that conversation with them and say, hey, I'm coming at this from an angle of care and an angle of safety for you. So yeah, that's what my advice would be. Thank you so much. Um, something's going on with the internet on this computer. <laughs> um, but we did try. I want to open it up to the room, though, because I know that we have people who also have a lot of experience with this. We all treat patients that are affected by gun violence. We all know people who have been affected um, either personally. I know, for example, we have Atala Brown. And sorry to you know, call you out, but I know that we have you in the crowd or anybody, if we could just ask questions and, and make it interactive, because I just want to see what you guys think about, you know, what our amazing panelists have done and what ideas you guys have seen work, not work, et cetera. I guess we pass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can speak out. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think by themselves they don't. And they'll be the first to admit it that one institution can't and should not ever be responsible for the violence of an entire city or a community. I think those, when you look at the literature, those that do it well are the ones who recognize that. And they try to partner. They don't come trying to reinvent the wheel. They do a great analysis of what's already there, uh, from things that are formal to things that are informal. And they're able to use community stakeholders. This is the key. None of these programs, even there in Boston, like Dave Mecca from Boston is like, uh, that's my dude. And he came to Chicago, and that was the first thing he said, was he was the glue to us starting our own trauma center. When I was a medical student, I fought for that trauma center, so I saw the whole process unfold. And what he was saying was that the pro where people fail in these violent, these hospital-based violence prevention or violence reduction programs is that they don't value those people who actually know what the hell they're doing. Right, so if you if you walk in and you're like, oh, okay, well I know this, I'm the new director, this is my first time ever getting this position, I read a bunch of papers, and we're gonna do this, and then you find out that for the first five years you fail flat on your face. And it's not until you say, okay, well, who knows how to do this work, and let me try to bring them on my team, then you still fail. And it's not until you start saying, this person should be the one generating the thought, screening the thoughts, you know, maybe they're not a great research, it doesn't matter. What do they think we should be doing? Because that's a valued set of skills that right now academia has no appreciation for, even in those of us like myself who are faculty members who carry those lived experiences in just in the pain that we've been through, that's never valued. There's never one paid more, there's never one getting buy down because they actually know what's going on out there. Instead, we'll always defer to that person who can has the most publications or does these things. So I think those ER docs, we're so 
common sense grassroots in our profession just by trade, I think that's a key position for us to always remember is that, hey, I'm the blue collar doctor probably in the room at all times. One blue collar thing I can do is show appreciation for those people who know what they're doing, who are out there, know what they know, know what they don't know, and try to fill in the gaps. Else we're failing, because at the end of the day, it's not about our prestige. This isn't about me or, or me getting somewhere. It's about the fact that I'm put in a responsible position over my community. So when I walk home every day into these streets, people are like, yo, Dr. Pratt, what, what's up next? What are we doing? Or I saw this, or I saw this other person doing this thing, and I, we didn't like that. They didn't do too well with that. Do you know them? Can you talk to them? So they're holding us, even not myself, my colleagues, responsible, you all, responsible, because they're, you're the people they always see when they come in for their wound checks, or if they got ostomy, or if they're paralyzed, or even if it's just a mental health break in their spouse or their peer. So that's the role that I think we can play. And so I, that is exactly the patient. So that one is the one we have such a unique opportunity to intervene on. And so really just that the next 10, 15 words after that, it's, it's really tailored to what that person's values are. So a lot of times I ask, first I explore their reasons for ownership. I say like, hey, so tell me why you own your, your gun. You know, a lot of times it's a hobby or if they're using it for work or if they're a vet and it's like tied to their identity. So I think sometimes exploring why they own can really help you in navigating the next step in that discussion. Because if it's something that's like, oh, we don't really use it, it was my dad's, it's just in the closet. Like that's a lot easier to have a discussion about why, you know, whereas if it's like, oh, hey, I got shot two years ago and I'm really fearful, you know, that's a much more challenging discussion, right? So it really ends up being a tailored discussion with that patient about why they own. And then at that point, it's sort of doing this risk benefit of like, hey, you own for this reason, but right now, you know, your wife left you, you drink too much, you're suicidal, like you really are very high risk for self-injury. You know, so I think at this point, it's a really good idea to maybe explore, you know, getting the gun out of the house just while you're in acute crisis. And just saying it just like that, like they usually are pretty acceptable with like accepting of that because they see that you're sort of, you know, you're in it for helping them. And so I think, and, and just exploring with them what options those are. Like, who is it, you know, that you can give your guns to? Either it be uh, a family member who's not high risk themselves, <laughs> you know, and that, so um, that, and or uh, off-site storage facilities. There's a lot of different options where people can. So some of our colleagues, which we didn't acknowledge today, so like Emmy Butts does amazing um, work in this field, and Megan Rainey and all of them. So there's a lot of really great people who do work in this exact field. But usually that's how I'd say navigating that discussion is really just tailored with the patient, just like you do for other, you know, other issues. I don't know if you guys have anything else to add. Quickly, the same way that you all approach like suicide by cop, do you all understand what that term means? In our neighborhoods and many inner cities, their suicidal also looks different than that too. They don't always come saying, I want to put a gun in my mouth. They'll come with much higher risky behaviors that would almost ensure themselves getting killed, right? So things like, you know, dissing the other set, going on social media, dropping your location, letting people know where you are, walking around with a gun, telling people you have a gun, pulling a gun out on too many people. These are the kind of things you should also be screening for, especially in the young male population, right? They may not always see killing myself because death is so easy to come about. You don't need to go put a gun in your mouth. That may be harder than just walking to people who killed your cousin and try to shoot seven of them knowing that seven of them have guns on them, right? That is a, like insane. And they'll tell you, I don't care if I die. I don't care what happens to me. I don't care if I shoot a young child. I don't care about any of that. They took my cousin. They took two of my brothers. They did all of this. So that's what I'm doing. That's actually suicidal, right? Like if you do, by all means, you, that's going to get you killed, son. And so I think screening for those things is also important. And I think if you're looking for the right person to screen, you missed five, right? So, so 
I think, I think one of the things that I've tried to, to reinforce in our education curriculum is that you gotta ask. Doesn't, you don't pick and choose who you're asking. You, you do your exam, you do your review of systems, you ask the question. Um, in kids, uh, interestingly, um, besides homicides going up, suicides have gone up, and the biggest proportion of suicide has gone up in black youth. And as, as Dee's talking about, it may be defined differently, but what we know of it, it's, it's going up 14% last year. Um, so you got to ask the question to get the answer. Now, we've all been taught the question is, do you have a plan? And that ain't the question. <laughs> and I'll tell you why it's not the question. 70% uh, of suicides are done impulsively, without a plan. The access is there. People get despondent. Kids get broken up with their girlfriends and boyfriends and they find the gun and they shoot themselves. And so that's the question uh, in any circumstance, access to lethal means in somebody who is despondent or even suffering a chronic illness, do you have the plan is sort of 1980s medical school. Um, and that's, you know, I think it's important to ask. Okay, I think we'll, let's do one more question. I know this. The, the 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 our only gripe is that this is such a big and like healthy and necessary discussion, and we have we literally did the longest that we possibly could. But let's take at least one more question, um, and then go we from there. Yeah. Oh, and sorry. The other thing I wanted to say is scan this QR code on your way out because we actually do plan to have follow-up discussions because this is not enough at all. Like we all know that this is not enough. So please scan this QR code, enter your email address, and we plan to, with the same people, have a follow-up discussion so we can go a little bit deeper. Plus others. Plus others. Plus others. There's so many people not not able to be in the room. Um, Coralie, I saw your hand, and I know Nicole. We can start. Quick, quick answer to that question is that it was it sort of preceded by the question that was, how do you get your institution to fund these things? That's how you get your institution to fund these things. The bed crunch is horrible right now. There's no place for patients. There's no psych after aftercare. Um, the 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 Boston city government was refusing federal funds because we are a safe city. That's ridiculous, right? And so the people who are suffering the most are the people that are not in the white part of Boston. <laughs> and there's no place to go for aftercare. So we funneled that attention. We funneled exactly what you're saying. We need to approach this from the aftercare side so they don't come back to our emergency room crashed into a tree, right? And, and Coralie, that's what the violence recovery program is supposed to do. The problem is, like you said, funding. So if they were to give this to 100% of people, now again, that's the one institution taking on the burden of a whole community. So I think that engaging it, connecting it with the people who do mental health, they get money, everybody gets money, you know, you find different ways to get funding to do that.
Okay. We might get kicked out, but one more question. <laughs> okay, Nicole. <laughs> So we've tried to explore that as like part of the social history of like smoke, drink, drugs, guns, you know, and like have it in there. But like, honestly, there's not, most of the, most of the triage orders have to have some sort of science-based, um, evidence-based backing to it. And given there hasn't been, and like the taboo-ness, which we're hopefully getting rid of that, I, I, I haven't seen that as like a, as a, as an initiative globally. I think there's been some data of some folks that have tried to have screening or at least some screening related to it, but not on a wide scale. And then what you do with that information, once you see that someone has a gun, like what are you gonna do? Like it, how, you know, um, same thing with like intimate partner violence. Sometimes people will check yes for that and then nothing happens, you know? And so it's, so it's important to be responsible with that information and, and also that contributes to the idea of like gun registries and so sometimes people are a little wary. But I, I love that idea. I think that would be great if we did. They're not kicking us out yet. <laughs> okay. There's so much more discussion to be had, but there's another session. So please scan your QR code, put your email, and we're gonna have a follow-up discussion because there's so much more to talk about. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you.